So today is the Trans Day of Remembrance, a day to raise our voices to effect change, to express our grief, and to venerate the mighty spirits of our trans ancestors. Trans ancestors who are too frequently stolen from this world by unspeakable acts of anti-trans violence, medical gatekeeping, and systemic oppressions. Our beloved dead queers deserve better ends, and we must continue to do the work to build a mutual aid network of support and protection for our most vulnerable members. That's beautiful. Thank you so, so much, Kat. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone to the Queer and, and Trans Death discussion panel. Um, it's going to be fantastic. Uh, we have some amazing people here. So if everybody would introduce themselves, I think that'd be a great way to start off just to give a quick couple seconds. Who are you? Pronouns, all of that fun stuff. And then and then we'll get, get into it. Ash, would you like to go first? Oh, I was hoping you wouldn't do that. <laughs> um, hi, uh, my name is Ash. I'm a queer trans funeral professional. I live in London in the UK. Um, and um, I'm also a new puppy parent. So you might hear some noises in the background. That's my dog. And uh, part of the work that I do at the moment is working in consulta consultation with a charity called Gyres, who are the Gender Identity Research and Education Society. And they're based in the UK. And they um, their purpose is to improve the lives of trans and gender diverse people of all ages. So what we're working on is a death and bereavement project um, to improve death and bereavement care for trans people. So that's kind of what I'm going to be bringing to today's discussion. Hi, I'm Kat. I'm a spiritual director, a coach, a priestess, a psychopomp, death doula, artist, uh, funeral officiant, trauma and crisis coaching. Like I kind of do the whole death sphere of things because there's a lot of people who are being missed um, in our current um, pathways to existential support at end of life. And so I am there to bridge some of those gaps. And so I'm a crossroads worker and um, it, it flows into my work here in, in queer co uh, communities as well. Hi, my name is uh, Tiana Dargent. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a cis white settler on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Um, I primarily enter the sphere as a death doula, a queer death doula serving my queer community in an anti-capitalist framework, which is uh, really important for me. And I also volunteer with the Home Hospice Association of Ontario and through them do a lot of facilitation of discussion groups specifically for queer people around death, dying and bereavement. And we're moving into a more educational sphere shortly. So I have been and will be continuing to do educational modules for um, organizations and individuals individuals practicing end-of-life care specifically around inclusivity for the queer and trans community. Um, I'm Meredith, my pronouns are they, them, and y'all because I'm Southern and that's how it works. Um, so a little over a decade ago I started working with a group called Angel Action Atlanta and uh, which started with Romaine Patterson and her angels um, looking out after Matthew Shepard's family during the trials. So one of our co-founders got in touch with Romaine and she agreed to have us sort of be a descendant of her original angels. So we started doing that um, anti-bullying, offering a symbol of hope at pride, at other events, at funerals. And um, my dearest friend came along and she is working with um, trans incarcerated folks and she asked if we would be one of the pillars of of that organization like a broader organization one of seven pillars so we are doing dying and death care for queer folks specifically uh, starting with our transgender community that are currently incarcerated and post-incarceration because this is where folks in dying and death care slip through the cracks where you know, you are no longer just just dead named, you are just dead to society, even more so. Um, and we are hoping to, through all of the paperwork, keep you as yourself, as you were in life, and also in death. Good morning. Um, I'm Moon, pronouns are she, her, they, them. I live in Southern California, Ackerman Territory. 
I'm a queer death midwife. Um, I'm a podcaster. And um, I just enjoy being able to shine a light on people like yourselves, interview other queer folks, particularly that want to talk about death and justice. I'm interviewing Meredith, uh, you know, right after this conversation. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how I've been showing up lately in our community. Um, did I miss anything? My dog's here. He's being really distracting. Um, and that's, that's it, I think. Dog distractions are always welcome. Okay, so I'm gonna kick it off with the first question. Is that all right for everyone? Perfect. Um, okay, so where are queer people getting lost, falling through the cracks and not getting the help they need? Um, I'm gonna just pick on one of you and then, and then you can kind of just naturally flow in and out of discussion. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna actually ask, Tiana, can you start please? Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, I'm just gonna maybe share my personal story of like finding the cracks and being horrified. Um, but I've um, been following like my death care journey for a number of years now, and I wanted to like go right into serving queer community because I know when I'm looking for a service, like any kind of service, like a chiropractor, like I'm number one looking for a queer person so that I can see myself reflected in in who's caring for my body and who's caring for my spirit. And um, so I was taking this death doula education and being like, yeah, I'm gonna volunteer at a queer hospice. <laughs> Surely that exists. <laughs> and oh boy, it really does not. Um, it Maybe there's one out there in the world that is like purely run, but it's not something that I found. And so I just kept like digging and I was like, okay, well, there's not a queer hospice. Maybe there's a hospice with like a queer program um, or something like that. And so there's like a little bit of that happening, um, but really in my area anyway, there's, there's very, very little. Um, there's one hospice that is specifically AIDS related um, and, and that's basically all there is. So for me, there's just like a real gap in queer specific services. Um, and we can talk um, about the reasons for that. Um, mainly I see it as uh, a whole generation that didn't get the opportunity to age out of life. And so the demand for spaces for queer people just didn't happen at, at the time that all the other advances for queer care have happened. Um, and so now we're at this place where we're needing to pioneer services for the queer and trans community because we haven't had the swell of people to, to do that before. Um, and so that's what I feel dedicated to, to come to is to provide services specifically for the queer and trans community. So like the stuff, what I was gonna say, it flies on from what Tiana is saying. So um, I was thinking about this and I was thinking about how we're actually taught from quite a young age that we're not supposed to speak about being queer. We're not supposed to talk about our sexuality or our gender identity. And for me growing up, um, there was something in the UK called Section 28, which meant that the promotion of homosexuality was illegal. So when I was at school, my teachers were not allowed to say the words lesbian, gay, bisexual, or trans. They're literally not allowed to say the words not allowed to speak about it, any homophobic or like queerphobic bullying that happened in school was just glossed over. So you learn as a kid, when I need help for something to do with my gender identity or sexuality, it's not there. I can't talk about it. Why would the help be there? Um, so section 28 only got repealed in 2003. So by that time I'd gone to university. Um, so, when um like as a queer person i was kind of like navigating like um, healthcare services um anything to do with sexuality or gender identity it like i didn't know that there were queer spaces out there i didn't know there were charities that were helping so the most ironic thing that ever happened to me i was homeless um and uh i was in my mid, mid to late 20s and i actually was homeless around the corner from a charity called stonewall housing who uh, provide housing advice and emergency housing to LGBTQIA plus people. I had no idea they existed until a few years ago. So it's just like, um, yeah. And 
I wasn't pointed there by mental health services. I wasn't pointed there by GP services. Like nobody, like people don't know the places exist. So you don't ask for it because you don't think that you're going to get help. When you do ask for it or you seek help for something, nobody knows which services exist. And then, you know, when you do sort of go and use those services, you find out that other services, especially with death care, there's no requirement for funeral directors to have diversity and inclusion training. There's no, you know, the link between that professional service and the grassroots community organizations helping people is sort of, it's like we need to take it that extra step. So the, the, it's like, oh, the, I said, walking, like walking through this, it's like trying to walk on cobblestones wearing a pair of high heels. Like there are just like cracks and pitfalls everywhere. Like there's no space where there is not a crack in the fabric of, of queer care at all, anywhere. The people that fall through the cracks, we we tend to think more about those cracks that are closer to us than further away. Like, for example, like I I would just say kind of blanketly, we're all here. We all have a laptop. We all have a cell phone. We all have ways of communicating with each other. The queer folks that are falling through the cracks right now are those that are less privileged than we are. Those that don't have cell phones those that are out in the rural country um when we were when the two trips i made to kentucky recently um because we had a death in the family uh on the way back i noticed this really large sign coming like out of kentucky um and into tennessee that was this huge advertisement for prep for hiv and i'm like whoa whoa whoa, whoa. hey this, this is the one place that after driving like six hours, several interstates, I found one sign in the middle of nowhere, fairly close to a military base, talking about prep. Now, what that kind of showed me was the further out you get, the less communication you get, the less direct it is. Those are the people that are going to fall through the cracks more and more. So if they're rural if they are poor and specifically the folks that we'll be dealing with folks that are incarcerated no one wants to think about a trans sex worker that's incarcerated because that was her job that's the only job that she could get and what will what are the statistics for her to hear about what all of us are trying to do for our community they've only got a couple of ways of getting that information and you can get it through either the programs that are already going in for trans folks and go, hey, we're working on dying in death care. We want to help you get ready to, to die. No, none of us want to think about that, particularly since, again, today is TDOR and today is the day that we remember the people, you know, our trans and non-binary folks that died by violence. It's a lot of people. This is the most violent year we're at what was it 375 globally transgender folks and when i read off the names one of the names last night in our group i read the name of a 12 year old child a 12 year old trans child who probably had no information on how to get help so you know if there's a way to reach out find ways of getting into the cracks getting through other organizations you know we're on this great top tier and if we can find a way not just to do things digitally but we still have to work grassroots and we cannot forget like going out shaking hands and meeting people face to face and doing what we have to do so that's Part of the reason we're doing what we're doing, those that fall through the cracks, getting them their paperwork, their pulse forms, their advanced care directives, living wills, Hopper's affidavit, if you need to change your name and can't afford it, and you need to change your gender marker and can't afford it. So it's all of these things that, how we're gonna try to help people have a good death and die the way they want to. Thank you so much, Meredith. And we have a comment, um, Gray says, that's a really, a really important point you are making about the urban rural divide and also about class when it comes to access to resources and culturally competent care. Absolutely, the intersectionality is such a fundamental 
uh, part of this conversation. And um, I'm so glad that you highlighted that. So thank you. If I could just say that, just to tag on to that, because I'm from a rural part of America, um, you know, over on the East Coast, uh, definitely one of my passions is advocacy for domestic violence. I, um, you know, lived through that. And it's also part of the reason why I became a deaf midwife, um, because my former partner died um, by suicide. But um, that experience taught me so much about, um, look, for instance, how to navigate uh, the police. And um, they misgendered her uh, while they were t also telling me that she was dead. I had a restraining order. I had all these things that were happening. And besides my, my current partner, because, you know, we're lesbians, so I was already repartnered. It's very complicated, but um, it was very scary and eye-opening that, um, you know, when you're dealing with systems, they don't value you. They were like, well, basically she was an addict. She was abusive because I'm telling them, you know, I had a restraining order and she was, you know, a queer person. <laughs> like, what do we care? You know, like it's your problem now. Um, so one of my passions since I've moved to California is advocacy for survivors of domestic violence, um, but also just like talking to people about destigmatizing things like that sort of, you know, um, are really destructive in our communities, like addiction, like, you know, being houseless, like you were saying, Ash, not having the resources um, just because we're queer. Um, and also just, uh, yeah, I think that that's it. That's what I want to say. So um, on the piggyback of that, um, again, like queers fall through the cracks like much earlier than other demographics because we are multiply marginalized and get gatekept from um, essential services all along the pathway, um, services that, that uh, straight folks take for granted. And so um, <clears throat> the gatekeeping and, and the problem starts much earlier where we don't feel like we can access affirming care with doctors where we can't access um, affirming um, uh, psychological support um, through our, our networks. Um, and so I find that, you know, systemically along the path, because we don't have access to the traditional methods of support, like family structures or religious structures, we are forced to like build these structures for ourselves. But if you are facing systemic oppression, building anything for yourself is really hard. And so like the concept of like mutual aid networks becomes essential if we want to start talking about queers having good deaths as opposed to like violent deaths or tragic deaths, you know, or um, ostracized deaths, like, or being forced back into the closet. Um, at end of life care, because of course there are no queer people who are, you know, of a certain age. Like it's just ridiculous how many things that we are not even assumed to be in the room for these conversations. And so I feel like a lot of the the problems that we face at end of life are actually structurally imposed and gate kept from us. And only by having discussions like this where we start talking about how to build these mutual support networks, are we going to start making some traction and making that part better for all queer deaths across the board, making sure that we have longer lives, better outcomes, better um, affirming care when it comes to um, aging in place solutions and, and um, home hospice care and um, mutual aid aging in place networks. Thank you so much, Kat. I think it's, that's a perfect segue kind of into the next question, um, which is how will queer dying in death care revolutionize how we handle death as a society? Um, and will the changes we make, uh, who will they benefit? And I'm going to pick Kat. Cool, because I was ready to talk. <laughs> um, so this is the thing. Um, Queers have always sort of been on the cutting edge of revolution 
and we've needed to be because, like I said, there isn't structures built for us. And so we need to always be constantly thinking outside of the box for, you know, how we're going to make our livelihoods, make our community safe, make our um, community sustainable and um, survivable. And so I feel like once, just like in the AIDS pandemic, you know, um, once we start looking at like what the, the necessary solutions are for inside of our community, we can start building the structural support network. And just like the lesbians came in and protected, you know, the gay boys that had that had the AIDS and, you know, took care of and, and nursed the community and made sure that they had the loving, compassionate support that they deserved, you know, um, it wasn't an easy time, you know? And this is this is how we've always done is we've seen a need because we've already fallen through the cracks and because we have fallen through the cracks we don't want other people to fall through the cracks and so we start trying to weave these networks of support together and so i feel like revolutionizing queer death care is going to actually spill out into a lot of beautiful ways um, across the board um, just because we can see that the the points that the system is currently failing us and therefore we can create solutions that that will serve the greater public overall. It's really interesting that you mentioned the AIDS pandemic cat because one of the things that I um, was I was talking to a, um, a funeral celebrant about at a conference that I spoke at previously and they were talking about how during the uh, during the AIDS pandemic, the kinds of funerals that people were having were very different from what had happened before because you had um, like the family of origin were not necessarily at the center of it. It was the chosen family, the friends around that person. And because people knew that they were likely to die or had so many friends that were ill and dying, they were thinking about how to say goodbye. And that's kind of like the sort of beginning point for more personalized funerals people making those decisions saying maybe I don't want it in a church maybe I don't want um you know just sort of like a traditional like Church of England funeral maybe I don't want this maybe I want something different something that we've created for ourselves so I think that you know the rest of society have already benefited from the kind of um the the revolutionization <laughs> um that, that that's already happened so and we found that as well in the in the COVID pandemic with uh, people having to do funerals online and things like that. And it's, I very much felt that, you know, queer people have been kind of doing this all along, finding their spaces, finding ways to connect to each other using technology. But like you say, Meredith, people who don't have access to technology do fall through those cracks. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah, I do have other stuff to say, but I can't remember what it was. So I'm gonna mute myself and <laughs> pass the candle. <laughs> One thing that's been coming up for me a lot lately is um, when we're talking about like a specific thing that might benefit the greater population that comes from the queer community. Um, when I'm thinking about support in the death, dying and end of life process for like extended networks of care and um, like chosen family and all this and how it has a mirror to me for um, any kind of family structure that's outside of the nuclear family. So here in a hospital kind of setting, you can have a visitor that's your, your parent or your spouse or your child, and, and that's about it. Um, but that's like, out, even outside of the queer community, that leaves out so many family structures that include like people with lots of aunts and uncles and um, uh, all kinds of extended family that just isn't supported in this model. Um, and because we really focus on like heteronormativity and nuclear family as like the primary thing. And so like any anything that will uplift the most marginalized always, always uplifts everyone else as well. And so that's just like one example of where I can see some change happening in some places and where we could have a little bit more. So there was a, a quote as I was flipping through socials earlier, and I'm not sure to whom it's actually attributed. The uh, picture was was of Tupac, but it could have you know been anyone else. Not sure they didn't really cite it, and it said, "At the end of your life, six to eight people 
uplift your coffin? What would have happened if those six to eight people uplifted you in life? Now, the interesting thing I thought about that was, uh, I didn't think about our immediate family. Um, I thought more of our queer family, like, but our queer family is usually much bigger than six to eight people that are going to lift up that coffin. I'm telling you right now, it's too, that's like too small. And the times, you know, that we could, for example, when we had my, my, um, Da's celebration of life ceremony, only a handful of us were allowed in the little chapel at the VA, but then we could have had up to 150 people go by the gravesite, you know, where we had his urn buried. I'm like, okay, that's great. But my father, not that many people. He just wanted, you know, we, we need to have, I think, more options. And because queer folks and folks of color have had to find alternatives to, you know, for having like a l larger family for, you know, having a non-traditional family, you know, we're talking about like adoptions and stepkids. And then, you know, in the queer community, we have houses, we adopt each other, you know, it's like, oh, these are my, you know, for me, these are my burlesque children. It goes down to great grand gays. You know, I would love for like all of the kids in the great grand gays to show up, but like, that's always kind of hard in these settings. And I think that with COVID and with finding alternative ways, like we're trying to find, because we have financial issues, we're also find, trying to find less expensive ways for, you know, the end, our end of life care. So what are we, what are we ending up getting? Well, we're, we're getting natural burials. We're getting, you know, though these are kind of expensive at the moment, recompose, aquamation. I mean, you can get your ashes put in a reef down in Florida to build up the wildlife. I mean, you know, we're finding all of these amazing things. And then, you know, we're able to tell the cis folks about it. It's like, oh, hey, guess what I found today? Oh, wait a minute, you found what? You know, I don't have to be cream. You know, I don't have to, you know, get embalmed and then, you know, six feet down and in concrete and no, you don't have to do any of that. Not if you don't want to. And it, because we have to find inventive ways of doing things, we are running and seeking them out. But the challenge, like we've all talked about, is how to get that to people who are less fortunate, don't have the communication, you know, like, and then all the rules and regulations that, that go with that. For example, here in Georgia, you can have a natural burial, have everything at home, but the one thing that you have to call the funeral home for is to transport the body. Have to, by law. In theory, I could have taken my friend Janine's body in my little tiny SUV and hauled her up with her, her dearest up to um, the natural burial ground, but nope, this is the one thing, you know, Things have become so streamlined and industrialized since the Victorian times. It's like, you go, you're like, wow, but I don't want that. Or I can't have that. So, you know, we, we get to go on sort of like this. And forgive me if, you know, I love research so much. Like we get to go on these amazing deep dives and find these treasures for dying and death care that we can share with others and we have that opportunity the challenge is, is getting it out there i just want to jump in and say really quickly that transportation laws um, of the body vary by place to place where i live in british columbia canada um, as long as you have the paperwork you can do your own transportation you can have your home wake and you can have your home funeral and but we have like been pushing for that. There's an, an organization here, um, Cynthia, that was uh, started by a queer woman, um, and which is, uh, her, her passion for the work came from, again, the AIDS crisis and, and um, the support that she created there. But um, check into your local laws. There's a lot more than you think you can do. 
I just wanted to mention that real quick. <laughs> in in the UK, there's a um, an organization called the Good Funeral Guild. There's a Good Funeral Guide, and on there they have a whole guide of how to do a funeral yourself in the UK without involving a funeral director. So yeah, the laws are completely different everywhere. But it was really interesting. I, what I was going to go on and say was um, like all of the conversations that we're starting to have, one of the things that we talk about is um, the care of the body and who gets to do what and who is allowed to do what. And a lot of things that we, like the protections that we have when we're living, like in the UK, we have the Equality Act, we've got the Gender Recognition Act. Um, it doesn't apply to people who have died. So the law applies to living people, but not to dead people over here. And the conversations that we're having, I feel like I want that to start a conversation about what rights should dead people have. They should have the right to a dignified death. They should have the right to be treated equally, regardless of, you know, anything. And it, I just really hope that, that, that conversation is going to start being had by people and the people are going to start saying, hang on a second, like we need to do better here. We really, really do. And hopefully, hopefully this will be the start of some change. I would like to add on to that. Someone I'm interviewing tomorrow afternoon um, in Portland, they used to be, um, I guess, working for big corporate funeral homes and then uh, two queer people that um, wanted to change exactly what you're talking about. And they've created a business called Rainbow Removal, Rainbow Removal, um, because what they were experiencing by going to crime scenes and just regular good old fashioned death scenes, um, bodies being disrespected by um, the police or whoever is there called there first. And kind of like what I think someone was saying earlier, I think it was you, Meredith, but you can't just take the body. Um, and so like if there's an overdose situation, the police are called. They're kind of like trying to create this radical little team of you could call them first, you know, um, and they would show up and they would advocate for the body. They would advocate for whoever is in the situation. Um, and here in the States, you know, it, it varies like Portland, it, Oregon, it makes a lot of sense that this would be like, you know, the first state that would be able to <laughs> make that happen. But um, I just think it's such a cool idea. Um, and just wanted to share that they'll be talking about tomorrow with me. Can you share your thoughts on the concept of ecosystems uh, and mutual aid? the idea that excluded people create services for themselves because they have to. Um, please elaborate. Um, Meredith, I'm going to pick you. So, you know, you're right. That question and our responses before kind of go into each other. Our, our main challenge in creating mutual aid and getting to each other is finding each other. And that goes back to what Ash said at the very top of our panel here is that We've been told for so long in this, you know, generation, shh, shh, shh. and as that trickles down the line, we're able to, at this point, what, hell, I came out like four years ago at 47, I really, um, you know, still not totally out, but the thing is, is that, you know, as it trickles down into people who have less they're not as able to come out. So it's, you know, you, you get these situations like, I don't know, like I had in high school with my best friend, Sean. Sean wasn't out as anything, but you know, sometimes you have that radar as queer folks. You're like, hey, hey, let, I think we should hang out. Let's hang out. And this is how we end up connecting. It's like, hmm, you're different. Yes, you're different too. Ah, and then like, oh, yep, <laughs> the gaydar. So we all have that. We also, I think, tend to have, also for those of us um, that have had abuse in our lives, we kind of congregate together. It's like, oh, so this has happened to you. Well, yes. So we sort of trauma bond as well. So we find each other, we trauma bond, and then, you know, we're able to kind of like, so, hey, I, um, uh, and you come out and they're like, oh yeah okay great so moving on and you know you, you get together but you know 
spreading our information further out, getting that mutual aid to where we need to get it to go, it's really difficult, you know, like for what we're doing with folks that are incarcerated um, and post-incarceration, they don't necessarily have great contact. And it's not just because of the fact that they are incarcerated, it's also the fact of the system not allowing them to get information. Or two, if some young country child has, you know, it's like, oh, I'm queer, I have no resources, great. It's like, okay, so how do we, how do we reach that youngin out in the country? You know, these little whispers that kind of trickle down and we hope, you know, that they do. Um, you know, like GSAs through schools, Gay Straight Alliance, or what is the one at Atlanta International School is calling theirs sexuality and gay gender, gender and sexuality alliance. They changed it from gay straight alliance. So like, and then they have the younger group, which is called the Rain rainbow club. So if this can happen within schools and there's one out in Arizona to um, a reservation school, uh, the kids are called Skittles out in um, Arizona and we've written them a couple of times. So the way that we have to do this is sort of like pen palling with Skittles, talking with the kids in the Rainbow Club and the GSAs, and maybe that will trickle down even further because they see and hear so much about dying in death care that, uh, yeah, Moon, I saw that. Yes, thanks for art classes. And that is exactly how I met my friend, Sean, weirdos in art class. So, you know, that's, we, I mean, we have to keep talking. We have to keep having these discussions um, for those of us who are out or kind of out and allies, you know, it's like the further it gets and it's, it's an interesting topic for us. And so that also helps kind of bring things together and hopefully spread the word out and bring us all closer. And that's how I think that's got to work. You know, the combination of digital and grassroots, we can't stop either one. I'd like to jump in here a bit um, because of the what you were saying about the o overlap with like digital and grassroots, and that's something that I see a lot. Um, I facilitate online discussion groups where an intergenerational range of queer people come in and um, for those of some of you here have been there many times, but we get a lot of folks who were, um, you know, all hands on deck during the AIDS crisis who were like, we learned so much, we did so much. And that information is stuck in my little bubble of community in my local area, because when it all happened, the internet was just a little baby and nobody was interested in sharing our success stories because they didn't want us to succeed. And so now um, I'm finding through these conversations, these ancestors of mine, these queer elders are coming and sharing their knowledge to a incredibly captive and hungry audience because we want this information from our ancestors. Like we're searching for them. They're not born into our lives. We need to find them and cultivate relationships with them, cultivate reciprocal relationships with them because they need our young, energetic, like, aid and life force <laughs> at this time, and we need their wisdom and guidance. Um, and so it's, like, so heartwarming to me when I'm, like, talking to another leather dyke who's 70, who's talking about how she saw all her friends gather together in community and put into place practices that are now what are very standard safer sex practices that were not supported by public health. They were they were grassroots things done in the leather bars, um, the sex clubs to save each other's lives and care for each other. And, um, and that disseminated out and became something that everyone knows about now, basically. I mean, I'm sorry for you abstinence places in the US, you probably don't know about it, but... <laughs> um, 
safer sex practices are like ubiquitous in in my community where I live. And that's because of our like queer leather elders making this happen. And this energy still exists within us and we can gather together and share it and like build a community more effectively now than we could that like spans different geographical locations. And it's beautiful to see. And I'm so happy to be a small part of it. Um, I feel the same. I feel like um, there's a lot of there's a lot of solutions that that we have pioneered. Like I've said earlier, you know, we we've had to create these ecosystems for ourselves because none actually existed for us. And so um, I feel like part of being queer to me is like trying to carve out soft spaces for for us to just exist without the sharpness of other people's projections without the the ostracization or without the stigmatization of like who we are as people and um i feel like the ecosystems kind of like go back to that that axiom of like water even though it's like considered to be a soft element can wear down stone and can find a pathway through anything and so I kind of feel like the queer ecosystems are sort of like this mycelial network, this spongy mushroom network of like underground um, problem solvers. Um, and so our ecosystems have been needing to be mutually supportive by nature because again, the structures don't exist for us. So one of the things that I'm really passionate about is thinking about because I'm disabled and chronically ill is thinking about like, how am I going to age? How am I going to age in place? And one of the things that I'm really passionate about is um, talking about this intergenerational connection, but how we can use it on both ends to support um, an ecosystem in which the people who are aging can age in place, but we've also got a structure that supports queer youth and who have had to leave home for abusive situations. So what I'm proposing is everybody try to find a way to make this particular thought a reality, is what if we set up a Golden Girls style aging in place home for queers, right? What if we populated it with an, and trained youth who were at risk of runaway or at risk of um, entering into, um, you know, like certain practices that might not like benefit them long term, or having to be homeless, where we could pair these people with the elderly queers and make sure that the elderly queers are not being forced back into the closet at end of life, and supporting the the youth with a trade that then they can take out into the world as a personal support worker or as an administrator of these types of spaces. Like, what if we started seeding that into the consciousness and making those sorts of things exist? And yes, there are queer care centers, but they are really expensive. And so, like, again, these things are inaccessible for so many of us because we lack the intergenerational wealth that comes from having long term connections with our families of origin who, in most cases, have disowned us or we feel estranged from them or we feel unsafe at entering into those like standard sort of family takes care of family at end of life, or, you know, you go into a hospice at end of life. Like, what if we just really took that whole principle and put it on its on its head and said, what if we didn't put our dead or our elderly and dying somewhere else? What if we kept them with us and we kept their wisdom alive through this intergenerational feeding of skill sets and perspectives? And so this is something that I'm really passionate about talking about. And I really hope that this concept becomes something that we can like i said mycelial network you know spongy mushrooms you know weave together um this this forest of support this forest bed of support for queers you know where we can start talking about longer lifetime expectancies where we can start talking about less violent outcomes for our deaths where we can start talking about you know what it would be like for us to like have our queer elders not be 40, <laughs> have our queer elders be 80, have our queer elders be 90, you know, like, that's my prayer. And that's my dream. And that's the, the mutual aid network that I would really love to see built. 
who can follow that? I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> it's such an incredible, incredible, warm, amazing, just, yeah, everything. Um, I think like, when, um, I, when I was looking at what I was going to say about this question, um, I was thinking about Stonewall Housing, the charity that I didn't know existed when I was homeless. And um, they were actually uh, set up in, what year was it, 1983, which was the year before I was born. Um, and it was just um, a small group of women who were concerned that lesbian and gay people weren't being, um, that were being disregarded by housing services. So basically, homeless person needs a home, you're queer. No, you know, go live on the street. Um, so Stonewall Housing was born. And now they're, you know, they're a registered charity. They help thousands of people every year with their helplines and advice lines. They've got um, supported housing for young people. Um, they've got um, an older person's worker. They're, like, they're involved in the project that I've just put a link to in the, in the chat. And it's like looking at that and thinking that began with a small group of people in the 80s thinking, we have to do something about this. And now this organization exists. And it's like, well, I think a lot of the little, um, the queer charities that are around did start like that. It started from people saying, this really awful thing is happening. What can we do about it? And they meet in, you know, the pub or in the front room or whatever. And they say, how can we, how can we do this? How can we do something about it? And then you get this organization. It's like what Meredith was talking about, but kind of trickling up, kind of like, how do we, you know, create these organizations that then have links to, you know, like the government or the NHS or like health services, whatever, as well as trickling down and making sure that the grassroots stuff happens and that people without access to the internet and in rural areas hear about these things. I'm just gonna do this for a bit. <laughs> but can I can I come and live in your in your home, please, Kat? <laughs> I think, I we think all it's something that I would um, so love that. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Tiana. Oh, I was just going to say, like, it, it's not that we need, like, one of these homes, right? It's that we need them all over the place. Um, and, yeah, in, in line with that, I mean, Kat, we've talked about it before, that I have, like, a dream of <laughs> making a home where it's, like, it, must, it doesn't even have to be a whole place just for dying. Like, in my home, I can have a spare room, and I can invite a queer person to come die in my spare room with care. Um, and and we can build networks in this way of folks who support each other to house people um, in our communities as as they're aging out of life. Um, and so it can look it can look a number of ways. There can be many different models. And what I love is that we can connect online over distance with each other and brainstorm these ideas and find the things that we can offer and that are sustainable to us each individually and communally and and find ways to make that happen. Um, the Outside Project, which is another charity for homeless queers in London, actually started with people um, who needed emergency accommodation being put up in a spare room of another queer person. And then they've ended up with their, their own premises. And it's just really like, when, as soon as you said that, Tiana, I was like, yeah, this has happened with homelessness. Why can't it happen with death care? Like, what's, what's stopping this from happening? Sorry, I'm literally making notes um, of all of everything that's being mentioned because it's just it's just so fantastic um, and also so necessary and so needed. Um, Kat, the mycelium analogy, um, you had me like I, I almost just burst into tears. You know, it was probably one of the most beautiful things I've heard in a really long time. So thank you. Um, yeah, we have a really lovely question, actually, to kind of finish on my side of questions and then I'm sure we'll have a plethora in the chat um but what connects you as a panel uh other than queerness and death um because you've all come from such different angles so please uh enlighten us I think that the thing that struck me most about working with the folks on this panel um Ash and Meredith and Tiana and Moon we've had a few meetings now so we, we're a little bit more familiar with each other and the thing that I think really pulls us together as a panel is the fact that we've all experienced um, this type of gatekeeping and this type of oppression, this type of struggle. And 
we are all the type of compassionate people who want to be that mycelium, you know, network, who want to lay down the structural support uh, connections for other people so that they don't fall through the cracks. And so that was the thing that I was struck by um, personality wise by everybody here is that there is a really strong desire to build the solutions that we wish that that existed. And so because they don't, we're taking it, we're taking it on and we're taking it um, to the next level as much as we can by creating, you know, discussions like this with varied topics, um, varied opinions on you know, how we can start making structural changes in different pockets of our communities. And I feel like that's a really beautiful tie for all of us here. I think that like each, each of us individually, um, we've already been that soft space, you know, before we started this work, you know, I, I have this feeling that all of us have had those friends and even strangers come up to us and go, you, could I talk to you? Could I, could I tell you the secret? You seem like a safe space. And I think because we've had that sort of mentor parental thing happening most of our lives, we're now finding ways of, of reaching out with that compassion instead of just having people come to us, you know, and that creates this wonderful kind of loop where it's like, oh, I, I talked with this person and this person does this thing. Maybe you would like to talk to this person. And now like we've all sort of found each other. And it's like, ah, I may not have the answer to that, but I know this person may. And, you know, we can refer each other back and we're creating, you know, we're creating networks. We're so lucky to be able to do this and to do this work um you know and we have an innate curiosity about human beings and how we all connect you know and it's i think connection and what we like to call well what my buddhist studies teacher calls active compassion it's not resting we're going out and we're we are com we are committing crimes of compassion here people this is what we're doing we are committing those crimes along with some shenanigans because you know it is death positive but that's i think that's what we've all got in in common <clears throat> is is this ability to connect and be compassionate and curious and fabulous <laughs> um also advocates we're all advocates so um, I think we all share that. Just tagging that on there. Be gay, do crime. Yes. I feel like um, we're. Oh, sorry. I'm go ahead. Right. I feel like we're um, because we come to this from different sides. It's like um, the connection is the differences that we have. So you know, some of us are more sort of like grassroots level literally kind of like they're holding someone's hand talking to them in the street I like to kind of hide behind my computer screen and do some research and you know sort of like I want to change the law I want to change the paperwork because for me like the way that I can make logical sense of something like is is the way that I can help people um and it and it you, you can't make change with only one of these things like real change all over the world has to you know has to happen from all of these different angles and like I f it's like it always just makes me feel really like warm that what connects us is not necessarily the same thing it's all of this different stuff I love that I'm so glad to like have, have met all of you as well because I mean I know that Meredith and I were were put in touch um I think through poetic endings was it yes it was um and yeah so it's kind of like Everybody knows somebody in the in the in the queer death world. <laughs> it's like two degrees of separation instead of six. I think that's what I was feeling too. It's like no one person has to have all the answers. And that's just like so narcissistic and myopic. And we get to come with all of our special interests and passions and skills and make this like beautiful jigsaw puzzle together. Uh, and we're 
were just a few of the pieces. And um, maybe like the rest of you watching are a few more pieces. And I love the idea of like, we're talking and you're hearing us and who are you gonna talk to and who are they gonna talk to and how does this ripple out and circle back and refeed into more energy? And I think that um, I just have loved talking with you on the panel and I'm so glad for all the people who are watching us here who are obviously interested and who obviously also want to see change happen. So yeah, that is the end of the questions that were sort of set up, um, but definitely not the end of this panel because I think such an important part is to speak to the 30 people that are here with us. Um, and yeah, which is so, ex which is so exciting. Um, and I just want to quickly say thank you so, so much for allowing me to be a part of this. And I'm so grateful to have met each one of you. Um, it has been a highlight of my experience uh, helping with lifting the lid. So I'm just feeling really grateful. Um, and this conversation just needs to keep happening and happening and happening and happening and happening. Um, so let me look, go through this chat. And I'm going to just call out any questions. I remember we had one quite early on at the beginning. So bear with me as I scroll. We did have a question um, from Izumi. I'm curious if trans folks have the freedom to choose who will hand handle their body in your countries. I mean, I, I can answer that from the UK in that trans people have only the same rights as everybody else does about choosing who handles their bodies. And it's all about writing a will, having it um, having an executor, having, having a funeral plan. Um, and yeah, you choose, you choose your funeral director in that will make sure that everything that you want to happen is recorded somewhere, given to people that you trust, make it really clear. Um, I mean, that's, that's in the UK and yeah, as far as being trans, being trans doesn't make a difference with that. I mean, the difficulties come where the next of kin or the family of origin might try not to make that happen and that's when you know you get solicitors involved and seek le legal help um and you know laws are different in every country as well so i don't I mean i don't know what it's like across the across the ocean with you guys it's very similar here. Um, again, it comes with like uh, pre-planning things if you're able to, but also there's like a catch, which is the same catch with all people, is that if you um, die in a way that necessitates like an autopsy or something like that, you're not having a choice about who performs that. That's just um, not something you get to select. So um, again, you wouldn't have control over that in any way, um, unfortunately. Um, and I think that you can't opt not to have an autopsy depending on the circumstances around a death. Yeah, that, I think that's my understanding in the UK as well, Tiana, there'd be certain circumstances where an autopsy would have to happen. And, um, I just want to mention like the, the ways to like best affirm, you know, that you're getting the type of care that you want is get it in writing and then let everybody know that these are your wishes. Because if you tell just one person, then you know, it could get missed if you don't have, you know, copies of these things where people can access them, you know, they're going to make the best decisions that they can in the moment. But if you let them know your decisions and let them know what your wishes are, you know, write them down and then tell everybody, <laughs> that's going to be your best sort of protection to make sure that you're getting the type of care that you want and make sure that you have your, your next of kin as somebody in your community who you can trust that will um, allow for you to, to receive the type of care that you want to receive and advocate for the type of care that you want to receive. So like this somebody, this person might need to be a community member um, who's good at advocating as opposed to like a beloved spouse or partner who might sort of break down around this topic. Um, at end of life. So like there, there are some considerations, but just making sure that your documentation is in place is going to be the biggest thing that we can do to protect ourselves and our, in our identity as well, dying. I just want to jump in as well and say that because a lot of people don't think that they can speak to a funeral director. They don't think that they can just kind of, you know, pick up the phone and say, hi, I'm thinking about my funeral plans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who are you? What do you do? How, you know, how do you care for, you know, people like me? And and yeah just do it like call them and and i think 
having a funeral director in mind that you can trust and you know that they will take care of you, then you know they will take care of your body. You know they will treat you with dignity and kindness and respect. And the same as, you know, having a celebrant or a, or a faith leader leading your service. If, if you know the people and you trust them and you want them to do it, speak to them. Tell them what you what your wishes are, what your feelings are, because the more people that know, the better. And it's much, much clearer when it comes to the point when you're dying. People around you can just make sure that you have what, what you want. That's huge, Ash. I'm just actually going to hop in off the back of that. Um, use your funeral directors. Um, as as someone that ran a funeral home for, for a year, um, call and ask any question you have. As does not matter how benign you think it is or how irrelevant or small or big or, you know, they're there to answer you. They work for you. Um, and so shop around. That's like the thing, right? Call every single one in your area. Who do you get on with the best? You know, like these are things, interact with it as much as you can. But my biggest piece of advice is, yeah, use them. Um, they're there to serve you. And I just want to hop in and say for those of you who are watching, who are care providers, funeral directors, end of life services in any way, um, it is a gift to the queer community if you put an inclusivity statement and in how you serve the queer community specifically up front where it's easily accessible. Because mm -hmm. it is exhausting for us to search this out. It's draining. If somebody is actively dying, that's not the time where we want to be freaking out about this. Make it easy for us. You can do it. It's nothing for you. And it changes so many lives. So here's that's part of what Angel Action Atlanta is going to try to be doing through our project called Your Legacy. So because so many of us won't have legacy because our families take it over, because people who don't truly care about the truth of who we are as queer people, they want to erase all of that. And in our death, they can totally do that they can take that over. But if you have, and I'm talking about forms here in the States, which may be different from some of those outside, get your pulse form done now. Get your advanced care directive done now. I had coffee with my transgender burlesque son and donuts and we did hours. He's 30, I'm 51. We're planning on this together. So, you know, I have two death buddies my friend who got me into part of, you know, the incarceration part of this work, Pinky. Pinky's my death buddy. Aiden is my death buddy. I have two people that are not my blood family that are taking care of my dying and death care already. The minimal is done. I don't have a living will. I don't have a regular will yet. I would like to get my body split up between recompose and a reef. You know, but the thing is, is that I know my mom doesn't want me cremated. I already have from my grandparents, two plots available for me and whoever. They set that up before they died. Their two plots, my mother's, my stepfather's and mine and whoever. I'm selling those two plots. I don't wanna be buried there. That's, you know, not the thing. If this isn't what you want, make those statements, get all of that paperwork filled out, have it in a sp safe space, you know, take, please, please, please take care of this. And even if you're a super young queer person, I know you have that feeling of immortality and fire. Please go ahead and take care of that now. Because while you have this immortality and fire, get it done. Help us out. <laughs> Help us because while you're helping us, you're helping our, you know, you're helping yourselves and then helping those other queer folks down the line. So by this way, oh, look, I'm going to create a pun on our own nonprofit to be. You're creating not only your legacy, but our greater queer legacy. Create it, your legacy. Amazing. I'm going to read out um, a comment from Morgan. Uh, I don't think it's so much a question, but just a contribution. Um, I want to throw in this thought that I've been discussing with queer friends lately, that elder in our queer and trans worlds is a certain thing, often less about numeric age than in other communities. 
Some of it has to do with the super high value placed on youth and looks and such, and also age versus age of coming out. But also I'd say a big part of how contracted our community's generations are is about how much shorter our lives have been and are still expected to be. Yeah, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and he's not much older than I am. And he was saying, I'm, I'm, I'm a queer elder. And I was like, wow, that, yeah, in a few years, I guess I will be too. And it, yeah. And, and then it does make you think about how our lives are not expected to be as long and how people from the generation before us have had to go back in the closet to access care at the end of their lives or, you know, nursing care or never able to, to come out and be themselves. Yeah, it's a really important, really important point to make because you say the word elder and people who aren't, who aren't queer or aren't trans might think, you know, 90s, in your hundreds, like, no, we're talking 40s, 50s, sometimes 30s, yeah. Serena wrote, for sure, easier said than done in rural areas where when there's no choice, insists that they make the time found it puzzling when a rural funeral home, the only one for a hundred kilometers and hardly any, po any population are in a rushy mood. Yeah. Yeah, it makes no sense. <laughs> and we have another thought. Um, Sorry, I just wanted to piggyback on the, the question previously from Morgan. Yeah. Um, is that, you know, the, the families, because again, if, if we are focused on, you know, not having long life expectancies. Um, you know, how do I want to say this? Okay, so Ash created this beautiful thing um, called Making Informed Choices When Planning a Funeral, a guide for queer people, which is amazing. Um, yeah, it's beautiful. I have it printed out right here and I love it. And I want to create a Canadian version of this. And um, the, the, what, my first reach was to a lawyer in my community and I said, you know, like, what is it? Is there anybody who's currently already working on this that I could put my energy towards uh, creating this thing? And the lawyer's response to me was, well, we don't actually even think that far ahead because our ends are much sooner than that. We're not thinking that far ahead. Um, we we're not afforded that luxury in a lot of cases and so like that's part of the problem right there is that again um due to the aids pandemic and systemic oppression like we haven't had the space to dream about what a good death could look like for somebody in our community in our circumstances and so those of us who are having this conversation um you know ideally we're going to be creating spaces for these outcomes these longer life expectancies these elders who are actually elder to like take up places of, of respect in our community um instead of being you know the western model of like aging is separate it's over here we don't talk about it dying is separate it's over here we don't talk about it and um and and going back to a more holistic um uh, idea of, of community where the elders wisdom is centered, where their experiences are um, appreciated and learned from. And so like, I feel that's a really big important thing that uh, needs to be interjected is that we really haven't had the space to dream about these things. And the fact that we're able to, that we're at this point and we're able to have these conversations now means that there has been some progress. Has it been all that it needs to be? No, but we're getting there. And it's and it's um, about the, the space that we're taking up and um, making space again for softness, for more queers to land um, and be held in their choices at end of life. Thank you, Kat. I'm just gonna have a flip through here. There's some really great discussion going on. Um, I'm just going to highlight something that Elizabeth said. I'm part of a nonprofit called Wake, working on queer death care advocacy in Louisiana. We're working on queer. We're working on a queer end of life guide, and we'll roll it out with death clinics staffed by volunteer lawyers and notaries, where people can complete basic paperwork such as primary right of disposition. The biggest challenge for sharing info in the U.S. is that laws change from state to state. 
our guide pertains to everyone in Louisiana, but there needs to be something similar for the 49 other states. Makes it so difficult. Yeah, that is definitely our challenge. Um, and, you know, yep, y'all have it for Louisiana. We're working on it for Georgia and um, Freedom Overground, who we work with, um, who is our fiscal sponsor is um, they work with transgender incarcerated folks and just um, post incarceration. So they've got clients sort of all over the states. Um, mainly we're gonna be focusing on Florida since we've got a few people there, um, some people that are doing research there as well. And like, you know, a couple of little states, um, I found out of some things actually about Louisiana from a friend who was incarcerated from the time that he was a teenager up until a few years ago. Um, so uh, Louisiana has one of the first volunteer hospice programs in um, Angola prison. Out of a thousand prisons in the United States, there are only 70 to 75 hospice programs. For example, in Georgia, there are zero and barely any hospital care at all. So this is what we're fighting against. We're fighting a huge system when we get to the work. But the thing is, is that we're connecting and we're getting together. For example, Johnny, who was my friend who was incarcerated in um, Louisiana and Angola was, had this post. It's like, would you believe me if I told you I had been a slave? And I was like, oh, what is this on Twitter? And I read the whole thing and he's talking about his time in Angola. And then we start discussing it and we're getting these wonderful little connections because we're able to do this work. Um, if you'd like to, you know, reach out and we'll talk about what you're doing in Louisiana, we can talk about that here. Also, just as an FYI, I know here in Georgia, your post form, um, no, I'm sorry, it's your popper's affidavit. If you need to change your name, financial issues, or your gender marker and you're having financial issues, your popper's affidavit differs not by state, but by county breakdown as well. So that goes from big to even wider. Um, more than happy to, to talk about that. But yeah, this is, this is our challenge in the states because we're the states, but then we're not always together on everything. Just highlights how difficult systematically, right? The systems are built that way for this exact reason. There was a comment from, another comment from Morgan that I, I thought was really uh, worth kind of acknowledging. Yeah. Um, There's a, 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 a long comment that what I, what I picked out of it was um, that it's in our work, we need to not just care for the person who's died, but for their family. So, um, so there's an example here um, that uh, Morgan recently worked with a dying 97-year-old woman who was straight and Catholic, mother to an anti-vax born-again Christian daughter, but that daughter's kid was a super genderqueer, raging homo, and the grandma was super supported, supportive of them. Um, I want our death care world to show up for all the queers and trans and non-binary folks who die, and also all the LGBTQ2S beloveds of folks of all stripes who have died. So it's really worth acknowledging that the person who died it might be, you know, they could be anyone, but the people that they're in their family, the people close to them, are also, are also queer and also need to be cared for because they're bereaved, and that's a really difficult thing. And all of the the stuff that comes up when you are bereaved, like family tensions and past traumas, and you know, all of the stuff, or you know, kind of going to a funeral when you're in the middle of transitioning and people not everybody knows that you're out and you know some people might know you as one person some people might not some people might know that you're gay some people might not um is is a really difficult thing to navigate and I was, i'm really thank you morgan for for pointing that out because it's something that really needs acknowledging definitely um i find that's primarily the source of my in-person support work is helping the queer community with dealing with the deaths that are happening in their lives, not their own deaths, um, and, and being recognized and seen and acknowledged in the spaces that they're going to help 
probably usually like blood family members. Um, and so it's like having having a buddy there to help them advocate for what they need and to see. So I love I love seeing that comment. So that um, you know, we're all talking about being able to make those connections. So once once we're able to be up and running, um, that's kind of what, with your legacy, what we're hoping to do is have an active list of things that we do as your legacy. Like we help you with the forms, you come into the office, we take care of these things, or we send them with your attorney or your loved ones to your place of incarceration so that you can get all that worked out. And then the passive list, of, you know, when we have a fabulous website, the passive list will be all of the queer allied pastorships, all of the funeral homes, all, you know, everything that you need. Do, okay, what do you need? Do you need grief counseling? Fantastic. Do you need, um, you know, do you need a rabbi? Do you need, do you need someone from the Church of Satan to do something for you? We have that. Oh, do you need someone Wiccan? We've got you covered. Ooh, that's not true. Mm, out of state, but we can bring them in. Like, you know, you have this huge list of everybody and everything that you need. And then that list can have its own connections. Like, oh, I know someone out of state that can do that for you. So what we're hoping is not just to be just a hub of information, but also to help you and then find ways of like, see, we're all here. We're all connecting. We're connecting across the puddle. We're connecting across the border, we're, you know, everything. We have that fortune. And now that we've got this great fortune, we can reach out further and get these people that have fallen through the cracks or get to other people that can reach those people that have fallen through the cracks. And that's how we're going to work it. And that's how it's going to happen. So I want to comment on that front. Um, I'm part of something called Queer Death Collective. And um, it's a fairly new um, organization that we are death doulas and like me, Psychopomp and other people who are doing um, ancestor veneration and some people who are working with herbs at end of life. And um, some of us are creating art um, as grief work and processing stuff. So um, we're on Instagram as queer uh, underscore death underscore collective and um, I also want to just highlight a comment um, that my beloved left in the chat, which is Eliza wrote, um, you're an elder when everyone you knew who was ahead of you is dead, which as a 41 year old trans woman with a certain experience is the case for me. And that's kind of the thing. It's like elderhood is sort of thrust upon you. It's not necessarily something that you feel qualified to take on. It just means that like um, you might be one or two steps ahead of somebody and that's enough to bring them one or two steps ahead, you know, like and and sometimes that's the, the small steps that we can make that stretch um, our capacity for growth. So, you know, um, in understanding that that we have this access to not just our biological ancestors, but our queer ancestors as well, to draw strength from, to draw encouragement from, to draw um, inspiration from is really important, um, especially as we start uh, aging and start um, considering what our legacy looks like. Thank you, Kat. Are there any other questions that um, people have? Yeah, if you do, please just drop them into the chat. Um, or if there's anything from any of the panelists that just it's on your mind, um, yeah, jump in. I just wanted to uh, not plug the guide I wrote, but kind of plug the guide I wrote. I've got a, <laughs> a there's a there's a little booth and it's it's a free PDF. So it's uh, the that should be the picture that you see when you look for it in the. Uh, I think it's in the expo section of, um, yeah, um, of the, what's it called? But in, in the back of the guide, there's a bunch of links to support services and uh, places in the UK where you can get information about um, uh, planning for your funeral, like information about the law, stuff like that. Um, and I think like because this, because the nature of this conversation is, you know, we're talking about death, we're talking about um, 
ourselves and, and how we've come to this work from these really kind of difficult experiences that we've had. And we need to make sure we take care of ourselves and each other. And if we need to reach out for, to, for support that we do it. And, um, you know, because it's just really important, I think, to acknowledge that the support, like there is stuff out there. There's, you know, people to chat to all over the place. There's always somebody awake somewhere. Um, I want to make sure that people don't leave the conversation and think, oh God, like, what now? Where do I go? Who do I talk to? Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Ash. Um, yeah, so if anybody wants to check out that guide, which I really, really recommend, it's in the expo. Um, it's on the left-hand side of your screen. So go, go, go and do that. Um, we, have a, we have a comment from Simone who says, I need specific examples or ideas of what I could write in my death care planning paperwork. What practices that bring queer and trans joy to funerals slash celebrations have you seen from elders or have planned in your paperwork? I just want to invite all of you to come to hear Merida speak in about 15 minutes about her work. And um, before we have to say goodbye, I just want to say thank you all so much. I admire all of you um, and the work you're doing. And I invite everyone who's here, if you have a story and you want to be on a podcast, reach out to me. Everybody should go listen to Moon's podcast as oh, well. Last night, thanks. so good. And I want to say that in an hour and 15 minutes, I am going to be on my own session talking about my work as a psychopomp, um, which is a person who is sensitive to the spirits of the dead and the dying and is actively working towards liberating those spirits and moving them beyond the veil. So basically ghost busting. If you're interested in the paranormal, come over and check out my chat. And Tiana has oh. a death cafe tomorrow as well. Um, so please also attend that. Sorry, sorry, Meredith, please. Um. Oh, no, that's okay. I was just going to say, um, I have a panel by myself tomorrow. Woo, the right to die queerly. So let's die queerly and rightfully. I just want to answer Simone's question as well quickly before, um, before we go. Um, so, I mean, in terms of a funeral, you can do anything you want like you, you do your funeral your way do what you want to do don't be kind of tied down by what society thinks you should do but the most important things i think for your paperwork and stuff is if you want your queer identity to be spoken about or not spoken about make it very explicit what you want said or not said what names you want using what pronouns you want using the name you want your death to be registered as if that's something like depending on where you're living if it has to match your birth certificate or not in the uk it doesn't um so yeah just like really clearly write down anything that you think people might try and do that you wouldn't want to do just write that stuff down um and then you know do what do what you want for your funeral just have have a blast well <laughs> have a blast but you know make it as creative or as you know whatever as you want thank you so much ash yeah, details, details, details. Um, that's my advice as well. Um, so yeah, let's wrap this up. Um, even though I'm sure we could continue to talk for probably five more days straight. So um, thank you to every single one of you on this panel. Um, we could not have done it without you. Um, it has been, yeah, like I said earlier, an honor and a privilege. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And to thank everybody that showed up. Um, it's been great and we can continue this conversation. Please connect to all of these beautiful souls on any sort of social media. Maybe if anyone can pop their stuff into the chat, uh, just so if anyone wants to stay connected, I think that would be really useful. Um, and yeah, okay. So we bid you farewell to see you later. Uh, not a goodbye. Um, lots enjoy, of love. Enjoy the rest of the festival, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all.